Well, last week, um, we were looking at the, uh, the case of the demon-possessed boy that was delivered by Jesus when the disciples weren't able to deliver him. And when Jesus delivered the young man, how the crowd was, was uh, amazed, as they should have been. Uh, there was the, these last few verses that um, I was a little bit torn about where to put, uh, because sometimes we can sort of gloss over what appears to be an addendum that's just sort of tacked on. Uh, but really, there, is, there are no wasted words in the Scriptures. Everything is there for a reason. And really, every, everything the Lord says is meant to teach us something. So as I was looking at these verses, I was thinking, well, there's um, something here that I think could be helpful uh, to us. And that's, again, what, what I've been talking about already this morning. So let me go ahead and read this passage, and then we'll uh, take a look at it. We'll do a little bit of review. And then we'll look at at, uh, these verses. But let me start at the beginning of verse 43. And again, understanding the context of Jesus' miraculous deliverance of this boy from this uh, demon. Okay, we read this. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. There's a lot of things actually contained in those uh, couple of verses, a few verses. So Let's look at a few of them uh, this morning, and may the Lord um, uh, grant His blessing uh, to this. Now, remember last time, uh, we, we looked at that, that account of Jesus delivering the, the demon-possessed boy, and we saw from that uh, reasons why we don't often receive what we ask uh, from the Lord, why we don't find the strength we need to do what He calls us to do, Maybe even the desire to do that, because really the strength to do it comes mainly from the desire. Now, when the disciples failed to cast the demon out of this boy, Jesus actually gave them two reasons why they failed in in verse 41, when he said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, and by perverse he means crooked, twisted, you've twisted the right ways of the Lord. Now, when Jesus said this, he was addressing the Father, not, not his father, but the father of the boy, of course, the crowds, and Israel as a whole, but we believe he was also speaking to his disciples, okay, because they were not above having fallen into the same trap. Now, when the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 17, which was a parallel passage to this account, why could we not drive it out? He said this, because of the littleness of your faith. And then he went on to tell them that their weak, uh, why their faith was actually weak, and it was because they had not spent enough time in prayer. This, this type does not go out except by prayer. You should pray for a greater faith, a greater strength. Prayer is essential to nurture and strengthen faith. We need to spend more time in prayer. And so we ask the question, how are we doing in the faith department? Are we receiving what it is that we're asking from the Lord? Are we seeing the Lord work through us? Well, if we're not, could it be that maybe we're not spending enough time in prayer? Maybe we're not communing with the Lord in the way that we should be, loving and thanking Him in our prayers, because remember, prayer is not just asking Him for things. It's also adoring Him and thanking Him. Are we putting His concerns first in our prayers, asking Him to move His kingdom forward and for the strength to help us actually make that happen? Or is our prayer time essentially a couple of minutes basically handing God our list of personal concerns and then going and doing what it is that we really want to be doing? You see, that kind of prayer isn't going to build our faith. It's not going to build the kingdom of heaven. And as a matter of fact, God isn't going to hear and answer those prayers. So, We need a stronger faith, and it comes by communing with the Lord in prayer. But their second problem was the perversity or the twistedness or the disobedience, ultimately. Their disobedience in neglecting prayer, the way they should have been praying, in not believing that they could cast this demon out. But, of course, again, Jesus was talking to the crowds as well, 
and they were following or, or twisting God's ways in other ways. They weren't following the path that the Lord had marked out for them in His Word. They were making decisions based on what they believed was right rather than on His truth and on His morals. Now remember, in every decision, we can only do one of two things. We have, you know, life is made up of decisions, isn't it? I mean, how many choices do you have to make in the course of a day? Well, you know that every choice that you make, you are to make for the glory of God. And when we, when we have a choice to make, there's really only one of two things we can do. We can either do what we want to do, or we can do what God wants us to do. And every time we choose what we want over what God wants, it offends the Holy Spirit and it weakens our faith. Is it any wonder why the disciples didn't have the power to cast out that demon? Is it any wonder the boy was demon-possessed to begin with? The father didn't know what to do, as well as the crowds. They were all living in darkness. They didn't have faith. They weren't walking in the ways of the Lord. We need to listen to the Lord. We need to spend time with Him. And if we do that, as Jesus did, then the Father will listen to us. But if we don't listen to Him, if we don't spend time with Him, we shouldn't wonder that the Lord doesn't listen to us and that our faith isn't stronger than it is. We need to pray, we need to read, and we need to do what it is that we have read to have a strong faith that we might be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, that was what we saw last time. That was just a brief review. This morning, Jesus tells us three more things in this short passage that can help us grow with regard to the Word of God, our appreciation of the Word of God, our use of the Word of God, and um, perhaps an explanation why, for why sometimes we don't fully understand what it is that we're reading. So that's what we're going to look at, that we are privileged to have the Word of God, that we should carefully listen to the Word of God, that we might do it, of course, and that there are some things that we're only going to understand in God's time. So first of all, let's consider that we are privileged to have God's Word. Let's read verse 43 again. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that He was doing, He said to His disciples... Okay, we're going to come back to that, his disciples, to his disciples in just a moment. But let's look at the first part of it. When Jesus delivered this boy, he did it with such power and such authority that the crowds were amazed. The crowds were practically overwhelmed. They didn't know what to do with this. This was something they didn't see every day. We might use the common vernacular. It, it blew their minds. It caught them completely off guard. Now, that is the way that miracles were meant to stop traffic and get people to pay attention. I always want to emphasize this because we do have people today claiming to do miracles. I was in a church like that for many years of my life that claim to have the ability to do miracles. And I'm not saying that God doesn't do miracles today, but I don't think He gives anyone the ability to do miracles today. And the miracles that we hear about, the miracles that I supposedly saw when I was in those churches, always left me wondering, did something really happen? Was that person really healed? Were they really sick before and now they're healed? I, I didn't see anything happen, right? Uh, they weren't the kind of things that would leave you in awe, basically completely astounded. These miracles amazed them. Now notice also at what they were amazed. It doesn't say they were amazed at Jesus, that he had done this, but they were amazed at the greatness of God, Okay, I think that's important because when Jesus did what he did in all of his ministry, he didn't actually do it to draw attention to himself. He did it to draw attention to the Father, didn't he? Right? He came to show us the Father, to reveal him to us. We read in John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He has revealed him. He has basically exegeted him, which means that he is the one here to show us what he is like. So Jesus came to show us the Father. And in doing so, he also came to glorify the Father. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 4, in his high priestly prayer to the Father. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus' whole purpose was to glorify the Father and draw attention to him and to show us what he is like. 
Now, again, these faith healers and people that do these particular things draw attention to themselves. I heard um, one high-profile faith healer who is no longer uh, with us, uh, Oral Roberts, uh, years ago when I was in a charismatic church, the pastor's conference, it was a huge conference, talking about his hands. These hands, these hands have been laid on many people. These hands have healed many people. Oh, boy, okay. So you did this, Oral Roberts. Well, of course, God did it through me, you know. But, but that isn't the attitude we see here with Jesus. His attitude was to draw attention to his Father. And the point is this, that when the Lord works through us, when he does something through us, not necessarily miraculous, but gracious, maybe providing encouragement to someone else, helping somebody who's in need, or perhaps most importantly, leading somebody to Jesus. It shouldn't be, there's another notch on my Bible, you know, I, I've done it again. But rather, we should give glory to the Lord, give Him the credit, give Him the honor, because He is the one who is actually doing it, right? So our purpose is, to, or really, we need to give glory to God in everything that He does through us, following the example of Jesus. But now, more to our point. While the crowds were marveling at God's greatness and they were distracted for the moment, Jesus turns to his disciples and he tells them something that he did not want the crowds actually to hear, something that was just for them. Now, remember we read earlier in Matthew 13 that Jesus spoke in parables, not to illustrate the truth, not to make it plainer and more concrete so the people could understand it, but he did it to hide the truth from, from people to whom the truth didn't belong and at the same time to reveal it to his disciples. He said to them in verse 11 of Matthew 13, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Basically, Jesus is telling us this. Some of what he has to say is for everyone, right? When Jesus began his ministry in Mark chapter 1, he says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That was the message that was meant for everyone. Some of it, part of it, part of his truth is for everyone, okay? But most of it, okay, most of it is for us, for those of us who have trusted him, for those of us who love him, for those to whom it has been granted by his grace. We need to understand that the Bible, you know, its majority of the Bible is addressed to us, and that's the way we need to read it. That's the way we need to understand it. That wasn't the way I was taught to understand it in, in some of the churches I was in before. But basically, I read it as though it was a letter addressed to the world and that everything that it said in it was addressed to each and every individual with regard to everything God said about how he feels about us and his church and how he loves us and all the wonderful things he has for us. We apply that across the board to everyone, but we need to understand that that isn't applied to everyone. It's applied to those to whom it has been granted, right? So we shouldn't hand a Bible to an unbeliever and tell them that this Bible is addressed to them in actually in absolutely everything that it says. If we do, we're, we're doing them a misservice because they're going to come away with the impression, God loves me just the way that I am. And I'm just going to continue then to go the way that I'm going. And, you know, they, they can come away with all different kinds of conclusions. But rather what we should tell them is this. Tell them... Give them the Bible, but tell them what in the Bible actually applies to them. What applies to them is the law of God, okay? They needed to obey, but they failed to obey. The warnings that they're in danger because they have broken this law, but also the offer of the gospel applies to them. The promise of eternal life, if they will repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and if they do that by God's grace, then you can tell them everything else in the Bible will also apply to them, right? All the blessings will apply. All those expressions of love that the Father has for those who are His own in the Lord Jesus Christ will apply. All of His gracious promises will apply, but they don't apply as long as they are outside of Jesus, okay? So the Lord has given to us His Word, and it is addressed to us. It all applies to us if we belong to Jesus, which is why Jesus turns to his disciples to give them something that belongs just to them. Now, the second point is this. Since God has given us his word, we should carefully listen 
to what it says. Now, when Jesus turns to his disciples, the first thing he says in verse 44 is this, let these words sink into your ears. Okay, Jesus was going to give them something that he didn't want the crowds to hear, and he wanted it to sink into their ears. Now, what is it, first of all, that he wanted to tell them? Well, it was the same thing that he told them earlier in Caesarea Philippi. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. He wanted them to know again the price that he must pay, the price that he was willing to pay in order to deliver them from God's judgment. The Son of Man would be delivered into the hands of men. And what he said earlier was, and he would be killed, and he would be raised again on the third day. Jesus was preparing them for his crucifixion. The departure that he was speaking to Moses and Elijah about on the Mount of Transfiguration that we saw a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about Judas' betrayal of him. By the way, Judas was among the disciples when Jesus said this, and he probably had no idea that he was the one who was going to do this at the time, right? But Jesus says, Judas basically is going to betray him to the Jewish leaders. This is what's going to happen. And then they are going to hand him over to the Romans, and demand his execution. So the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But let's also not forget who it is that's actually handing Jesus over, okay? Because it's not just Judas. It's the Father, right? The Father is handing Jesus over because he had to die. Listen to what Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost speaking about Jesus in Acts 2, verses 22 and 23. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. See, ultimately, Jesus was handed over by the Father. Jesus had to die, didn't he, in order to bring us life. Now, last Wednesday... This is a little bit of an aside, but I think it's important. Last Wednesday, when we were discussing the books of, of Judges and Ruth, okay, we asked the question, why does God allow all this evil to go on uh, in, in, among his people, uh, as it was in the days of the judges, it was terrible, and why he allows it in this world? He could have prevented evil from coming into the world. God didn't create it. It came from the creature that he made, but God isn't responsible for it, but he's the one who allowed it. Why does God allow it? God could stop it at any moment. He could say, that's it. All evil is gone, right? But God doesn't get rid of the evil, and the question is, why then does he allow it to continue? Well, the answer to the question John Gerstner tells us is this. It's because, and this, this, you know, if you haven't heard this before, it sounds a little bit strange, but it's good that there is evil, Okay? It's good. For what? For God's purposes, okay? It's good that there is evil. God is the one who allowed it by his plan to come into the world, and he was intending to work it together for good. That doesn't mean that evil is good. It doesn't mean when you do evil, you're doing good because God's going to work it out for good, but it does mean that God uses evil for good purposes. And here is the clearest example we have in the Bible of that very thing. God used the greatest crime ever committed, the greatest evil ever perpetrated, the betrayal and the execution of his son to bring about the greatest good that he has ever given, which is salvation or eternal life. And really, apart from that evil, then it, it wouldn't have taken place. If Jesus had not died, salvation would not be possible. God uses evil for good purposes. The father hands his son over into, into the hands of evil men in order to put him to death so that he might save us. Now, that's what Jesus wanted them to hear. But I want you to notice this. He didn't tell them this just so it would pass into one ear and out the other, right? He wanted them to remember this, and so he says, let these words sink into your ears. Literally, the, the Greek says, Take these words and put them in your ears, okay? Put them there. Keep them there. Listen to what I'm saying. It's a Jewish idiom, right? It's the way they would say it. I want you to hold on to this. Hear what I'm saying. Now, if we listen to God's word passively, right, 
when, when God is revealing it to us, if we listen to everything the Lord tells us in a passive way, in other words, you know, we're not really paying that close of attention and just kind of goes past us really quickly and once it's passed, we, we forgot what it is you just said, but, you know, it probably wasn't that important. You know, if we think, if we, if we listen to God's Word, if we study God's Word, if we read God's Word in a passive way, then we're, not li- we're likely not going to remember what it is that we've heard and what it is that we have read. Learning requires effort, and Jesus was telling his disciples, I want you to put effort into listening to what I'm telling you right now because I want you to learn this. And what is it again that he wanted them, or I should say, why did he want them to remember this particular item? Well, it's because this was going to happen. He didn't want it to catch them off guard. But Jesus also wanted them to learn something when it actually did take place. When it happened, he goes, I'm telling you this in advance so that when it happens, you will know something. And we actually learn that from John 13, verse 19. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am. And the word he is is basically supplied by the translators. He basically says, you know, I'm telling you what's going to happen in advance so that when that actually takes place, you will know that I am. I am is the covenant name of God. You will know that I am the covenant God of Israel. There's a reason why Jesus told him these things, many reasons perhaps, but this is one of them, that he might actually know who he was. Something they couldn't quite figure out. Even when, if they could say it, they still didn't quite understand it. Now, why does the Lord want us to remember what he tells us? Well, for many reasons, not the least of which Jesus says in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and they are life. The truth is for our good. The truth is for our salvation. The truth is for our safety. God wants us to know the truth for all these reasons. He wants us to remember because he also wants us to do what it is he says, to apply the word. Remember what James says in James 1.22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. I think you understand that what God says in his word will actually do us no good unless we actually apply it, unless we actually act on the word. It does us no good at all. It actually does us a lot of harm, doesn't it? Think about the person who has heard the word of God his whole life but never acts on it at all, period. Never trusts in Jesus, never serves him. What's it going to be like in the day of judgment for that person? Well, what did Jesus say about Capernaum where he was teaching and preaching in their streets and doing the miracles he was doing? What did he say about Capernaum versus Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, he said it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Capernaum because Capernaum had all of these advantages and all this truth and Sodom and Gomorrah sinned under all this darkness, right? So where there's more advantage, there is more responsibility. The Word of God will not do us any good if we don't act on it. It will actually harm us even though it's meant for good It'll work against us in the end. But if we actually listen to it and do it, it'll be greatly to our advantage to trust in Jesus and to follow him. We also need to remember it because our hearts can so easily deceive us. Deceives us into thinking we're actually doing what's pleasing to the Lord when we're really doing what's pleasing to us, what we want. We need to remember to basically uh, keep our hearts in check because there's sin in our hearts. What we want to do is not automatically the right thing to do. We often want to do things we shouldn't be doing. The Lord says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's our heart, okay? Even with the grace of God, we still have sin in our hearts and it can deceive us. So we need to compare what we want with the Word of God to make sure that we're doing what God wants and not what we want. So we've been entrusted with this Word. Jesus wants us to remember it, okay? And then the third point, which is kind of an interesting one, we need to realize that no matter how much we study the Word of God, no no matter how much we listen to it, read and preached and so forth, there really are certain things that we're we're really not going to understand until God's time. 
I think we may all have experiences like that in our lives, passages we didn't understand perhaps if we move from one theological position to another. But listen to what Jesus says in, in verse 45. After he told them the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, he said this, uh, Luke writes, but they did not understand the statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask <laughs> him about this statement. Now, it's interesting. Um, statements that are being made here. Now, Jesus wanted them to hear again that he was going to be betrayed. But apparently, he didn't want them yet to understand it. You know, God can actually give us his truth and reveal things to us, but then not at the same time reveal things to us. Now, Jesus knew what his disciples were thinking. He knew what they thought about him, that he was a political Messiah and not a spiritual Messiah like the rest of Israel thought, that Jesus couldn't die. This is the thing that, that kept confusing them. How could Jesus die? Listen to what Israel thought in John 12, verse 34. The crowd then answered him after Jesus talked about the Son of Man being lifted up. We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? How can you say the Christ has to die? The Christ remains forever. Well, this is the same problem the disciples had. They thought he was supposed to be there forever. He was going to lead them against the Romans to political freedom and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. They did not understand, and Jesus knew that. Now, he also knew that not understanding what he just said, they were also afraid to ask him about it, but Jesus didn't explain it. Okay, he didn't explain it. And if he had explained it, they wouldn't have understood it. But why didn't he explain it? Because it wasn't the right time. Okay, it was hidden from them, concealed, so they could not perceive it. By Jesus, by the Father, by the Holy Spirit, it wasn't time. Now, there are those occasions we've already seen where the Lord reveals His truth, such as what He did at Caesarea Philippi, when He showed Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. But there are also times when He conceals the truth, such as what He does here, because it isn't the right time, because they weren't ready to hear it, because they weren't mature enough to hear it. Remember what happens after Jesus is crucified? They all go into hiding, right? They didn't understand what was going on, even though Jesus told them many times, Son of Man must be crucified, he must die, he's going to be buried, he's going to be raised again on the third day, and as soon as he's crucified, they all go into hiding, not expecting that he's going to rise again from the dead. They still did not understand. Sometimes the Lord doesn't reveal those things right away. It takes a while, okay? Um, they were likely not able to handle it at this particular juncture. And I think in the same way, even though the Lord has given to us His Word and He's given us the, com the command to study it, sometimes He doesn't allow us actually to understand certain parts of it until we're ready. Perhaps it would somehow blow our minds, chase us away, we're not mature enough to handle it. Or maybe it's because of the direction we would go or how we would influence other people. He doesn't reveal some things until we've grown to the point where we can handle it, where we can comprehend it, where we can accept it and benefit from it, be built up by it. You know, that's one of the reasons why there's different positions in different churches on different issues. So we shouldn't be surprised if we don't, if in our study of the Word of God, we don't get it the first time or that we don't understand everything that we hear. The Lord will show us when we are ready. We just, you know, He's given all of it to us, but there are certain things He's only going to show us in His timing. We just need to be patient with ourselves, okay? At the same time, we do need to be patient with others, okay? We need to be patient with unbelievers to whom we're witnessing because the Lord may not reveal it right away to them. He, I mean, really, it's in His time, isn't it? And it's His mercy, purely. So we're patient, and we wait upon the Lord, and we pray. We need to be patient with other believers as well when they don't see things the same way that we see them, assuming, of course, that we have the truth and we're, we know we do from the Word of God, who may differ with us on these things that don't directly have to do with salvation. There are certain things they, that you cannot differ on, okay? 
those fundamentals. We have to believe in a triune God. We need to believe in a Christ who is both God and man. We need to believe salvation is by grace through faith alone. We need to believe the Bible is the word of God. There's a couple of other things we need to believe, okay? Those are non-negotiables. We need to convince them, and I believe the Lord will allow us to do that, but there's many other things the Bible teaches, things that divide denominations that are not essential to salvation, and the Lord may not necessarily show these things to them right away. So we just need to be patient. We just need to keep showing them the truth, knowing that when it's God's time and His will, He's going to open their eyes if that's what He wants. So in the meantime, patience, right? We need, need to be patient. So the Lord has given us His Word. We need to study it and hold on to it and apply it. But we also need to understand we're not going to get it all at one shot. We need to be patient with ourselves as well, but continue to study and pray that God would reveal his truth to us in his time. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do that.